some interesting things about John. Here I was, this 15-year-old little scrawny kid, and he was just so cool about the whole process. With John Hughes, he had his pulse on adolescence. You know, in general, he had a really good sense of it. There was always this feeling that John never really grew up, you know, that he was one of those characters who he still could think like a teenager. He remembered what it was like to be a teenager. He knew that when you're an adolescent, the world is so centered around what you're going through and everything filters through that. I mean, these are all things that you can go to be clinical about, but he wasn't clinical about it. He, you always felt like he lived it. I think that John, um, because of his work in Lampoon and because of his sort of vivid imagination and writing style, was not too far apart emotionally from the teenage years, and there were things that had happened to him that he had remembered. So whether he had a pulse on teens at that time, he had a pulse on teens of his generation, and he spoke to some sort of truth. My experience of John is that he is an incredibly, he was very open when we did Breakfast Club. He is very sensitive, um, very funny, really excited about making his movie, and not a person who's cut off from how he feels about anything. Just, you know, sort of delighted by everything. <laughs> I just don't feel that there are a lot of filmmakers out there with the same affection for, for youth culture that, that John Hughes clearly had. John probably felt that he was maybe sick of the term kids movie being a negative term. Meaning, oh, if it's a kids movie, then it can't really be about anything then it will be frivolous, whereas I think we all remember some of our most serious times in our lives have been in high school when you, the big, you know, you're, you look back and you go, what an idiot. But it's like, things were very serious, things that were of great concern to you in high school. I don't think anybody can copy him is what the problem is. You know, he's just so original. I'm pulling the people in and his ideas and I know that there were lots and lots of movies and television shows about the kids in high school, the group in high school, but I don't think anybody can quite get that particular style that he has and that he always had. So, you know, what are you going to do? It was only him. I think John's narrative voice took everything in another direction because he had a great ear for dialogue, for talent, for character, for everything. He was able to sort of see it all and put it all together. He must have known that he had essential stories to tell about high school, and he must have been so aware of the moment that he was living in, the mid-1980s, because every detail in his movies, even now, looks right. It's, it's like going through your yearbook, and I think that's why kids my age loved those movies so much, was because they really, I remember when The Breakfast Club came out and I was a junior in high school, it just seemed like finally someone made a movie about what I think about and how I feel. You sort of identify those songs, not just from a period, but for, from periods in those films. I remember at the time, part of the myth of John Hughes that we all knew about as young filmmakers was he sat at a desk and he played all this great music all the time and that, you know, the music was a big part of what he did and that that was his sensibilities. Now, I have no idea if there's any truth to that. I have no idea whatsoever, but that's what we all believed. The way John does things, it's like he pin drops sounds and he pin drops attitudes. That's how he makes his films, which is highly unusual because he's on the pulse of something. He had his ear to the curb, so to speak, in terms of music. Yeah, he always sort of integrated that into the writing and, and also the producing of the films. It's the way the songs were juxtaposed with the scenes that made them effective. I mean, the songs themselves are not super cutting edge, but they're, they're, they're used so well. They're not just dropped in there. You know, the timing is always impeccable. And I always appreciated that there was the David Bowie quote at the beginning of The Breakfast Club. Even though I don't believe we actually hear that song, changes. It's such a great quote. My proudest thing about Breakfast Club, um, it's more than anything performances or characters or anything else, that David Bowie quote was mine. I found that David Bowie quote in the beginning of the movie and I showed it to John and he thought it was great and then he never said another word about it and I saw the movie for the first time and there it is, like right in the front of the movie. That's my proudest moment. And Don't You Forget About Me is amazing because it's just this like soaring anthem and you get that sense of triumph at the end of the movie with Bender, you know, pumping his fist in the air and 
It's, I mean, if you think about it, it was just a movie about a Saturday spent in detention, and yet you feel like some kind of battle has been won. You know, that's, that's effective use of music. Yeah, that song, I can't believe it. The song is still, you know, it's around all the time. It's funny when you see a new generation discovering things that are so familiar. You know, have you heard this amazing song by Simple Minds? Yes. Yes, I have. Hughes wrote a great script. It's not like he's precious about each word. He's precious about his own sense of truth. You want the truth? Yeah, I want the truth. I think he said that he um, had written Breakfast Club a really a long, long, long time before. And he had it in the drawer or something. You know, in the industry, it's called a Talking Heads movie, where people, you know, there formerly had been films like My Dinner with Andre or, you know, maybe European films where it's so simplified. But with that, it was really like filming a play. John said something like, that he wrote the first draft in a weekend. And both Amelia and I, it was almost simultaneously, I was like, first draft, okay, how many drafts do you have? And Hugh said, well, I got a, a few, why? And Amelia and I were like, can we, can we um, read them? This is during the rehearsal process. So he's like, sure, hey, so we read them. I was like, John, so how about if we put this? He was like, sure, let's try it. John was awesome about uh, making sure we had rehearsal time, which is like a foregone conclusion these days. You don't have that. You just show up on the set, you know, where's my trailer, where's my makeup? But with that, we rehearsed it. We really sat, just the six of us, in a room while the sets were still being finished and made. And, you know, we all had a lot of time to talk about it and share our insights about what we were going to do and how it could play out. But the rehearsal was key. Yeah, I really thought uh, that that's how they made movies. It certainly is the best way to go about making a good movie, I think, is when everyone's on the same page and confident and ready. He just wanted everybody to come in, you know, with their character and start playing around. That's how he shot it. I mean, he was so open to anything that anybody brought in or anything that happened in the scene, you know, any riff that you do off his writing. He wasn't precious about anything. Claire, you want to see a picture of a guy with elephantitis of the nuts? Elephantitis of the nuts or whatever. Judd came up. I, I don't know where that came from. John let us have five, six takes. I mean, his shooting ratio is pretty high, I think and then he would let us go off, and occasionally what went off would be used. There was a lot more improvisation. We had a, a script supervisor, Bob Forrest, I think his name was. How you doing, Bob, if you're out there? Um, I think Bob came out, he was cajoled out of retirement to do The Breakfast Club. And shortly after the completion of Breakfast Club, he, he for sure retired. Mole really pumps my nads. Well, yeah. He stopped taking notes and brought in a little tape recorder that he would like turn on because like, we've just because Hughes would put that 1500 foot mag on the camera and like that stuff like Anthony Michael Hall is just genius of him when he's uh, getting stoned and you know chicks they can't hold a smoke and he's like it's going on and we did a few takes of it and he's literally going on and on you can hear eventually the click 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 of the film in the mag because it's run out and it's just going around we're all aware of it it's not like Hughes doesn't know what that sound is but we're Gonna watch Michael for a while, why not? He's great. <laughs> Chicks, can I hold this smoke? That's what it is. It's hard to try and, and uh, recreate teen speak when you're not a teenager. It is, and it's, it's, it's hard to make it sound authentic. And I don't think there's a false note in, in terms of the vernacular in any of John Hughes films. Can you hear this? You want me to turn it up? I think a lot of it he made up. Like in Breakfast Club, like a, what does he call the guy? Like a magna zoom dweeby or something? I don't think that was pre, like a pre-existing insult. Um, but it's so awesome and, and people remember it. Face it, you're a neo-maxi zoom dweeby. Neo-maxi zoom dweeby. Every single character pretty much in the movie has him in it. He said Allison is me, but he also said that everybody's me. Just in terms of telling the story of these five specific stereotypes, what worked is no matter who you were, you can put yourself in one of those boxes. So that made, right from the start, it makes the film very relatable. Everybody's gone to high school. So there's a good chance that you're going to reach a very big audience because everybody knows what you're talking about. Saturday, March 24th, 1984. Shermer High School, Shermer, Illinois. He's just able to 
pull it out and not be trite about it or not be overly simple about it. They're complicated, all his characters. All of them, actually, even in the really broad comedies. They're complicated. It's John's heart. It's just awesome. I think that it's demonstrated by all of the characters in all of his films. It just kind of opened up those doors and said, you know, these stereotypes are there because kids in general need a place to hide when they're in high school. And you sort of hide in your, in your little box. People can relate to being marginalized in whatever way, in a relationship, in a family, at home, because of their ethnicity, whatever. You know? And uh, I think what's interesting is the film dares to kind of attack that in a way by using these characters. So it was, a, it was a brilliant idea. Those little moments where you see where these kids are coming from, where they've already had to put on their armor, and just the way the car drives away from Allie and the whole thing, you know, it's very subtle at the beginning. It gives us a nice setup to those guys. And the fact that Bender has no parent, that he's just walking on his own. I mean, I think that those are really good setups. I think that the kids have a lot of armor that they slowly uh, take off during the, during the film. That was the biggest challenge, is having them arrive at school with their coats and giving them their ID, so to speak. You already get a feeling of what you're dealing with with these guys. Marilyn Vance had these boards. They're like um, vision boards, basically, that somebody will make with, you know, um, ideas for different characters and cutouts from magazines. And she just had, like, Allison was all over it. It was just fantastic. That was to John's direction because when you're sitting in a, a space for a long time and you're just looking at each other and you're in a room of strangers and you start, you know, the air gets tight and you get all those feelings and suddenly one's taking off the coat and, you know, you're kind of adjusting to your atmosphere. And that's the progression. That's the genius of these films is that the level of the young characters and the older characters, they are not caricatured even when they're played as character types. And that's why John Hughes was a far better writer doing that sort of material than, than anybody else. Her middle name is Ralph, as in puke. Your birth date's March 12th. You're five, nine and a half. You weigh 130 pounds. When the Breakfast Club came up and we had shot 16 Candles, I remember John called me and, and he then told me about the premise and the whole thing. And I remember him pointing out the details of that character and how it would be different. You know, he's more introverted, quiet, little shy guy that ultimately becomes the voice for the group. He writes the letter and the whole thing. Who are you? And Lois. He plays a geek, but he plays a geek because he, he's a misfit and he's awkward. He's an awkward adolescent. And he's not the cool guy, and he's not the, the best looking guy, but he's the guy that you automatically go to for sympathy in all these films. In Breakfast Club, we're not saying I'm, I'm Judd Nelson. We're saying I'm Anthony Michael Hall. That's who I am. I think even the Judd Nelsons of the world probably identify with Anthony Michael Hall in that film. Michael's just, just lovable. You know, can't root against him. Ever laid anyone around here? Oh. You and Claire did it. Like when I out him, I go, oh, you know, oh, you've been with her? When I say, oh, he says that you two, and then she turns, then Molly turns on Michael for a moment, and he's still gonna be my friend. You know what I mean? He's that, he's got a kind of confidence that there's nothing we can really do to hurt him. The only thing that can hurt him is himself. Hey, Brian, how you doing? Your dad work here? You know, Michael is embarrassed. There's no doubt about it. They know each other. And it's not a bad thing, but he's embarrassed about it. But he realizes it right away when I make fun of him, and we all see him now having to cover. Then when he's upset that Molly says on Monday we're all gonna be how we were, uh, he's very believable when he says he would not do that. I believe him. I just wanna tell each of you that I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't and I will not. Because I think that's real shitty. And he shows us when he's nice to Carl on the way out. See you, Brian? Yeah, Carl. No, that, that's actually, the, oh, that's amazing. Yeah, like you get the sense that him and Carl are buddies. Claire makes the most astute observation because she says, because you have nothing to prove. Your friends idolize us or, or something like that. And then he says, yeah, which is true. You know, he has nothing to lose by befriending them. You're so conceited, Claire. You're so conceited.
and there's that amazing moment of Anthony Michael Hall's wrenching sobs. <laughs> well, fuck you! Fuck you! <laughs> Michael was just, Michael was, he's so, he's, he's a very sweet, sweet man, and he was just, he was lovely, and he, I don't care, he doesn't like this, but I did, I had this nickname for him, which was Milk and Cookies, and I called him that all the time, which he did not like at all. I don't know what that means. Would you say that to Sean Penn after Bad Boys was wrapped? I don't think so. <laughs> He's just so funny. And then during that whole thing, his, I don't know, I just, I just had to make a like, mental block against Michael for the whole thing. And I remember that little moment where like, I hit myself on the shoulder or something as if I'm doing a good job. Yeah, it is, it's cute, you know, it's just a way to kind of wrap it up and it's a way to give, you know, the other two have sort of paired off. He got, he got the shaft in that, in that sense, but he's also the smartest one and he would have written the best letter. Um, and so that's why it had to be him as well. That was sort of Brian's department to take over there for everybody at the end, because the thought being that he's, you know, excels as, an, as a student, but he's also sort of uh, digested the, the, the group therapy aspects of it and is then assigned to write that, that letter at the end. Coach thinks I'm a winner, so does my old man. I'm not a winner because I want to be one. I'm a winner because I got strength and speed. Kind of like a racehorse. It's about how involved I am in what's happening to me. Emilio, to me, in The Breakfast Club is the real sleeper of the character. There's something subtle and brewing about him that doesn't necessarily come off, even when you see the film for the first time. And I think that the more you see the film, the more you appreciate his performance, which I think is very subtle and good. I think it's obvious that John Hughes' allegiance is with geeks. So I imagine, and, and this is just speculation on my part, but I imagine that it was challenging to write this sort of relatable jock. And he pulls it off, and uh, you do feel for him. I like him. Of the five who seemed so disconnected, to me, he seemed like the guy who made the most effort. He's kind of like the pivot man in the, in the five of them, where he'd come to the defense of Molly Ringwald if Judd Nelson kind of said something inappropriate. Two hits, me hitting you, you hitting the floor. I think he was very honest in, in the way he treated Ali Sheedy. She was being weird, and he'd say, why are you being so weird? OK, fine. But I didn't dump my purse out on the couch and invite people into my problems. More than any one of them, if you really think about when you first meet Andy, he's in the pickup truck with his dad, and his dad says, You want to miss a match? You want to blow your ride? I know school is going to give a scholarship to a discipline case. He really doesn't say a whole lot, but you know immediately when he gets out of the truck and he slams the door, you just kind of know immediately without him saying anything that he's not, that his dad is putting this pressure on him. That may not ring as true to many people, but it does to athletes. They know exactly what he's talking about. It's all, it's just the, that elite athlete reveals him or herself a lot of times pretty early. I expected a little more from a varsity letterman. And the pressure begins on them that he's going to go to college because he's going to get a scholarship, without which he's not going to go to college. He's going to get a shit job, which means that maybe when I say, hey, uh, you know, Andy here is thinking about a job being a, you know, in the custodial arts or whatever. And uh, it's like that moment where it's like, hey, at least for me reading, it's like you go, that's not a fun moment for Andy, you know, and, and that pressure. And then why he's in there, you know? tells this ridiculous story about taping a guy's butt cheeks together. I mean, it is ludicrous, but it happens. And he's so like, I think he's great in the movie. He said, I did it for my old man. I tortured this poor kid because I wanted him to think that I was cool. He also had great energy and a great working spirit, and to the point where, like, in between takes, he'd be writing. I mean, the guy was on it. He does a cool dance. One thing that jumps out at me is Emilio Estevez kind of running around and singing and he runs into a room and he screams and the window shatters. It's completely absurd, but somehow John Hughes manages to kind of weave in these absurd moments and then still the movie makes perfect sense. It's a movie, so you get to 
sometimes do things that are unlikely but not impossible. I mean, there's nothing done that was impossible in this movie. He's using these devices that are more visual than expositional, but you understand exactly what Emilio Stevin is going through at that moment. He um, certainly packed a big lunch. Excuse me, sir. I think there's been a mistake. I know it's detention, but um, I don't think I belong in here. John Hughes obviously drew a lot of poetic inspiration from Molly's performances. And at some point, he lets her take over the character. Um, but it's, it's a really innovative bit of casting in Breakfast Club because he's having her play somebody who would have been friends with Carolyn in Sixteen Candles. Like, she's in. She's popular, she's rich, she has sushi for lunch and yet she's extremely vulnerable. If Molly wasn't written in such a way in The Breakfast Club, and her background wasn't written in such a way, I wouldn't know what to draw from, basically. He gave the roadmap to the look. So she's a prissy girl. First I wanted her to be like uh, the rich little girl in pink and a little beret and, you know, the diamond earrings, the little studs and little short skirt. And that was kind of, she was edgier than that. So then we went into that Ralph Lauren kind of straight wrap skirt with the boot, and it had attitude. Her clothes had an attitude. She had attitude. Now Molly, in front of her father, gives me an earring. So she's gonna have to, she's, she's choosing that road for herself, which is quite wonderful, because she and Daddy are not gonna get along the next day. It's gonna be good for me. So I'm okay with that. I think that Molly gets really unfairly tarred with really owning that character in Breakfast Club too much. I mean, I think she was doing a lot of acting and she brought a lot of herself to it. But Molly is very, very intuitive and subtle person. And, and she played that character to the hilt. Molly was just beyond her years. It never made any sense that Molly was, what was she, 16 when we were doing it. Um, she never seemed, Melly never seemed like she was 16, ever. Um, she's just beyond being a teenager, or she was back then, and now she's, you know, well, I felt like she grew into herself in her 30s. It's sort of like Molly was always 30, you know? And it never felt with Molly like, oh, Molly's, you know, five years younger or whatever it was than the rest of us, and still in school. It just seemed like, why is Molly in school? You know, like that. She is very shy. She was throughout the making of those films. I mean, there's a certain, uh, just a quietness, you know. Um, she kind of remains a little bit at a distance. Um, but it's, it's natural to her. It's not like an air, you know, it's nothing that she's putting on in a way. She had like really interesting eclectic tastes that weren't necessarily like a Southern California teenager that you would expect, you know. What's that? Sushi. Sushi? <laughs> Rice, uh, raw fish, and seaweed. In retrospect, you think back about, okay, that's raw fish for four hours sitting in a classroom. That's gonna be nice. It's so great, because we have time off and at lunch, I'm like, who's in around? Who can I fuck with? When Judd came into the audition for The Breakfast Club, probably heard the story, but he just came like the way you saw him in the film. I mean, he was like in the jacket, he had the gloves, he had the ball, he had the boots, the fuck you attitude, the whole thing. I'm getting a little rambunctious, I think, in the, in the waiting room outside. And the receptionist called for security. And so the elevator doors are opening with security just as someone opens the door from the side and goes, uh, Judd Nelson, I go, yeah, okay, yes me, yes me. And so I go in and so it's like, my, I was a little bit, Adrenalized, I would say. That was like, yeah, okay, cops didn't get me. When Judd walked in, he just had this sort of method, he had made this sort of method choice to just be like, I am Bender, and when are you guys gonna fucking figure it out? It's risky, it's a risky way to do it, but it just seemed to 
you know, certain roles, it's gonna be hard for them to believe that you can pull it off if you're not already pulling it off. With Judd Nelson's character, I mean, there was a point, if he came in in the black leather jacket and the, too obvious, you know, here he's wearing flannel, he's wearing a, a T-shirt underneath, he's got layers, he's got his boots that look horrible, he's got his awful pants, and that tweed overcoat. All his stuff was basically recycled. You make it look like it's been lived in, loved in, and his particular character totally works. People wanted that coat. People wanted to look like him. His attitude was perfect. I like that other people started wearing the clothes because my mother has been giving me a hard time for a long time. What's with the boots? What, tying the shirt around your way? Uh, tuck it in, tie your shoelaces. It's like, Mom. She's like, eh, you're a bad example. Kids are gonna fall. It's like, well, or better than being pushed, I guess, you know. The Seattle Sound copied uh, the grunge look of Judd Nelson in The Breakfast Club, okay? That was him. That was a changing moment for me because I did go out and buy a trench coat, you know, and I put pins on it and I grew my hair and I wanted to get my ear pierced so some girl would give me her earring. In the way that I think I related to Andy's character as who I was in that film, Judd Nelson was who I kind of want it to be. It's a really great performance, and, and again, it probably affected a lot of kids the way it affected me. You, you walk out of that experience a changed person. The Breakfast Club actually does get pretty heightened. It gets pretty melodramatic. I mean, at one point, like, Bender is, like, pacing through the library doing, like, a monologue about being beaten. You know, it, it is, it's, it's not super subtle, but it is, it's effective, and I, I think that's why people love that movie, is because it's not afraid to go there. I think he had to be big in order to come across as the rebel. His performance is a little bit bigger and more showy than everyone else's, but it needed to be. See, this is what you get in my house when you spill paint in the garage. All those moments where he's tearing up the book, and he door slams, and he curses at Paul Gleason when he leaves. Fuck you! Or him just openly being defiant, Everything builds up to the moment where Molly Ringwall kisses him on the neck. Why'd you do that? Because I knew you wouldn't. That redeemed him completely in some way. He's, for the first time, completely not really sure how to, what to do. He can't do anything. He can't tear anything apart or yell or curse. He's completely disarmed. And then she gives me a gift, which is interesting. I, I, and I like that John has me take it. Because theoretically, after my big speech about, you know, buying stuff, am I going to be so, you know, no, take it. Don't be an ass. If for no other reason than, you know, can talk to her, you know, Monday, maybe. I watched that movie, and I still love that movie, and I still love to dislike that guy. And I think Judd Nelson has had to bear that cross all these years, you know? I think people still strongly identify him in that role. I like that they respond well to that character, and I like that I was able to serve John's material. But it is strange that then I'm confused with that guy. He's really a funny guy. He, very unlike his character, super cool, so funny. You know, when I look back at my career, like certain people that stand out, and Downey was one of the funniest ones. You know, Judd is another one, one of the funniest guys I've worked with. Great, great spirit. Well, I love, I love Judd. I mean, Judd is um, geniusly funny, you know, really verbal. Um, he's, he's a real unusual character, Judd. He's just who he is. And I was really close to him back then because then in, during Breakfast Club, I just thought he was fantastic. And then, um, then we got to do St. Elmo's Fire, and then we did this movie that ended up being disastrous, but it was Blue City. I just, you know, I was, I, we were just really comfortable with each other. And Judd definitely came ready in that role. I mean, he was, he had a great passion and, uh, and a focus then, because he knew he had landed a, a great role, you know, and he delivered. Hughes writes this thing where the girl's gonna rub her head to make the dandruff fly out like snow over this beautiful drawing that she's done just with a pen. We learned so much about the girl then. Ha! Eat shit. Allison was um, it pretty exactly how much exactly how I felt in high school. Allison is a part of me. I mean, that she didn't have to come from anywhere. I didn't have to find her. She comes in this sort of coiled shell of a, of a woman, young woman, and uh, 
You know, she has, has these like burning looks at people. You know, she's an incredible actress. She's great. And that's an incredible performance as well. Allie is so, she's so gifted, man. Is it bad? Real bad? Your parents? Yeah. What did they do to you? They ignore me. Yeah. When they ignore you, you're just, you're not even there. These are her parents. That's the closest family unit. So Allie was so wonderfully damaged. It's just like, she's so great. Allison, man, that's a, what a role. I knew what I wanted her to look like because um, in high school, there wasn't really any goth stuff going on at all. I think that came after Breakfast Club, like further along. But there were these girls that I really thought were incredibly hip and cool. And they were all the, the really pale looking girls who hung out in coffee houses and listened to beat poetry, you know. I thought that was really amazing. That's what I wanted Allison to look like. I just wanted, I really wanted that. And he let me do it. I mean, it was, it was super pale and black eyeliner and that's it, you know. Done over and out. It's great. So we gave her that in the beginning and the darkness. You know, her behavior was chewing her nails and spitting it out and just behaving so grossly because she wanted to that kind of attention. And underneath everything was that little white camisole that showed this poor, poor, fragile person who really wanted to be pretty and really wanted to be accepted that way. And that's how we were able to reveal her character. I think Ali Sheedy's character definitely sells out. Um, I never got the impression that her, her, you know, black stuff on her eyes, as Claire calls it, or, or her clothing or her tussled hair, I never, I never got the impression that those were affectations. You know, I thought that was genuinely her. Why? Claire did it. I guess Allison should feel entitled to try on that persona if she wants to, but having men a, a very weird sort of black eyeliner wearing weird landscape drawing chick in high school, you know, um, I, I just, I felt slightly betrayed. You know, you really do look a lot better without all that black shit in your eyes. Hey, I like that black shit. Yeah, I fall in the sellout camp. I do, I definitely do. She plays such an odd, individualistic kind of character, and then she becomes more conventional to me. But I it never had a problem with it. I just thought it was another thing to talk about in relation to the movie. Whether what she does is considered a sellout or not, it actually seemed pretty real. She didn't. She let Molly do something for her. That's what it really is about. And she even says, the, again, he was like... Why are you being so nice to me? Because you're letting me? Because you let me. It's so honest and so... You know, a real connection. So we don't know if she's selling out. She's just letting Molly clean her up a little bit in that, you know, high school way. If you felt that was true, that Ali she sort of betrayed, you know, who she was at the end of the film, I think you could say the same for every single one of them. Because they all go through some kind of evolution, some sort of change. Hers is a little bit more physical. I think it was just about everybody wants to be liked. She is probably, in fact, Maybe, alongside my character, probably the most empowered by the day, it seems. I think that the transition, character-wise, is that she feels safe enough to be pretty, or, you know, and to kind of come out of her shell in a way. That's a, one of the most beautiful scenes, I think, in the film. And there's also that really nice score, which, again, it just, like, lifts it. What's wrong? Nothing's wrong. It's just... It's just so different, you know? I can see your face. Is that good or bad? It's good. I did talk to John about it, and um, my thing was I didn't think that she should be um, somebody who has a whole bunch of makeup put on her face, and then suddenly she's beautiful. So I wanted it to be, if, if we're going to do it, I wanted it to be that she, because um, she has all this stuff on her face, so it's white and the, all this eyeliner, that Molly would um, be taking it off. So it's kind of like, let's get rid of this mask or, what, you know, this 
thing that you've been playing and this is what you really look like. I that that works. That's okay. I didn't think I needed to have a pink shirt on all of a sudden. I feel like um I could have taken off my sweater and had like a some kind of like, you know, guy muscle tee or something or she didn't have to take off her sweater. I mean, it was enough. You know, just like stop hiding behind your hair and you know, I thought so I felt like it got like it went a little bit over the top. I remember him and Tom Del Ruth who shot it talking about how to do it really simply so it wasn't this sort of glamour sequence. And I think, I think that all in all, they did really well with it. I am the eyes and ears of this institution, my friends. By the way, that clock's 20 minutes fast. <laughs> The one thing that people have come up to me since, and I don't know whether you know this, but people are doing The Breakfast Club as a high school play now. I mean, it's been transcribed and kids are doing it in school, so I'm meeting kids that came up and played Carl. You know, I played Carl, I didn't realize how hard a role it was, you know? I said, there are no small parts, just small actors. I like the janitor is sort of this very quick-witted character. Who, I think he describes himself as a serf or a peon, which is, are not words you expect to, to hear out of the janitor's mouth. And, and you get the sense that, you know, this, this guy was, was maybe the, the wise-ass once upon a time, and now here he is, and these kids are daring to condescend to him. It's just, it's really cool. Another tour de force role. And that's a great and a very important role in that film, I think, because what he does is he kind of brings you know, Gleason's character to light for himself. You took a teaching position because you thought it'd be fun, right? Thought you could have summer vacations off? And then you found out it was actually work. That really bummed you out. He just kind of shows him himself in a way. You know, and here I am, the, the, the janitor, and you perceive yourself as some, you know, tough-ass teacher who's doing what, he, what he's in fact just doing is just monitoring kids on the weekend you know so those are I remember that scene particularly because he was so good in that scene he and Paul were great together I was kind of working on the premise in my head that this is a teacher that I might have had now that I'm the janitor he likes to lord it over me now this is the thought that wakes me up in the middle of the night that when I get older these kids are gonna take care of me I wouldn't count on it I slept in the janitor's office at the school and rarely associated with the cast, if ever. And I think John wanted to keep me away from the cast. And that sort of worked with the sort of isolation I had with and dealing with him. And when I came into that set with all that paraphernalia, the first scene I shot in Breakfast Club was unloading the garbage and, you know, by the way, that clock's 20 minutes fast, that whole segment. Um, I hadn't really met with the guys. I hadn't really known the cast. So there was a sort of sense of, of detachment and not being part of their group. You guys think I'm just some untouchable peasant, sir, peon, you know? Maybe so. But following a broom around after shitheads like you for the last eight years, I've learned a couple of things. I look through your letters, look through your lockers. I listen to your conversations. You don't know that, but I do. Carl the janitor resents the kids, but he does get them. He nails them. You know, he, 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 he really puts it to them, you know, verbally, um, in a way that, that, that the principal can't. Well, you know, there's this arrogance to teens, right? That anybody over 18 is just a jerk and, you know, is, has fallen off the earth in terms of their worldview. And, you know, it's just not true. <laughs> and somebody's got to hip them to that. And he had that strange expression on his face, you know? Like he knew better than us. It's unsettling. You know, when you think you know better than them, and he's true when he says well, how we perceive him, though my character not so much, because I do see him all the time. And he says that thing, it's Hughes again, that thing where he goes, and I've been through your lockers, I got the keys to all your lockers, and it's like, well, wait, oh, 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 and it's like, it's great, it's like, okay. Okay, so now that I know that Carl's going through my shit, okay. When I got the part, I remember thinking about the janitors that were in my high school. And there was this one guy that was, I would say, all seeing. And when John had that line, you know, I read your notes, I'm the eyes and ears of this institution, I really pegged onto that one because I really got the feeling that these guys knew a lot more about us than we cared to let on. People to this day don't realize that there's a shot of me at the beginning of the movie in the case. 
and that I actually went to that high school. John and I talked about that. And then my whole subtext was maybe I was a little bit of those guys there. So the fact that I could relate to those kids as sort of having left the womb 10 years prior um, is, I think, an important fix on it. Because, you know, I'm really paired up with Carl. You know, I, I, you know as we walk out, I love that because it's like, see you, see you Saturday, Carl. Yes, I mean, I, mean, I see him. Every, I'm there as much as he is. I mean, I haven't had a Saturday off in years. <laughs> See you next Saturday. You bet. Uh, Dick. Excuse me. Rich. Will milk be made available to us? Well, well. Here we are. What's going on in there? Hagalaga! Right. Why is that door closed? John Hughes was not particularly charitable to public educators. Paul Gleason's character in The Breakfast Club is the principal who has not a leisure suit, but the 80s version. Does Barry Manilow know that you raid his wardrobe? One good thing about that character is that it's clear that he's in detention too. That by having to be there to discipline these kids on a Saturday, he has to be there as well. And he doesn't appear to have a lot to do at school that day either. It's a bad day for him. Paul Gleason's a good actor, and he, he could play that role without turning it into a caricature, which I think is crucial to the success of that movie. You know, even though we all watched it identifying with the kids, on some level you have to believe that the adults are real, and he's real. You know that there are people like that, and you know that they have a heart somewhere, or you can be sympathetic to them, but, um, you know, you don't want to see them caricatured. The adult characters are amazingly set up for the kids to bounce from and off of. And in Paul Gleason was the perfect character, my God, he's holding court. And, and you could see the only authority this guy had was at school over these kids. And Judd was punching at it, kicking at it. Paul was a great guy to have as like an adversary. He was great. And he, and he brought so much to that as well, that looking at himself in the glass, the reflection of the uh, fire extinguisher thing, like, hey, Haganaga, as he's walking on, it's like, he's so cocky. Haganaga! Right. Paul Gleason didn't have to ever try to be funny. He just was. I don't know who came up with that weird contraption on his desk. He's spinning something at some point. He was great. Out! Thinking of trying out for a scholarship. Give me the ball, man. He wants the ball, and what am I going to do? It's like, like I'm going to go, like, because I want to... And, I'm, and every take, I do it slightly different. And so when I rolled it to him, he booted that ball at me. I was like, yay. But I knew he was going to do that, too, and kind of hoped that he's not going to hit you. But you have to take it if he does. Let's go. Hey, keep your fucking hands off me. When he's having that standoff with Judd Nelson, you feel this sympathy for both of them. You know, like, you're supposed to feel, oh, the principal, he's just this jerk. But you just feel, like, what do you do with essentially a fully grown man who doesn't want to be in high school and is giving you this sort of interminable shit about everything. There, there's a threat of violence. They're gonna like throw down. That freaked me out. And I'm gonna kick the living shit out of you, man. I'm gonna knock your dick in the dirt. I really thought he was gonna whack me and I would have taken it, I had to, you know? And so I kind of flinch and he doesn't do anything and he goes, I, I knew it. You're a gutless turd. I'm like, ah, damn. I mean, there's real anger in Paul's character that's, that's uh, palpable. When Kapalos catches Paul reading the files, and, he's, and he goes like, oh, dick. And, I'm like, and he's like, well, well, no, I don't think we have to say anything about this. You know, it's like that great thing. It's like, so he looks like a kid then, too. And after about two, three takes, John came up to me and says, cut him off. Ask him for 50 bucks. And the look on his face was pretty real because we yelled cut and he started bearing down on me going why are you interrupting me and what's going on and it, it was it was difficult for a few moments after that because um, he didn't expect that what 50 bucks John asked me about casting and he brought up Paul Gleason's name and we'd both seen him in trading places and there was this hilarious scene which he called to mind which made us both laugh where this old lady approaches him and he's on the payphone she wanted to use the payphone 
and he just had this great kind of stern look that he could always like summon. And the lady comes up to the payphone and he looks at her and he goes, fuck off. And it's just like one of the funniest things ever. Unbelievable, it's like, oh, what's my job? I was like, oh, he, that's excellent, you know. Clarence Beeks, who ends up in that monkey suit. Oh, God. But Paul was a great guy. I mean, Paul is, is a guy that became a friend of mine. You know, and I'd hang out with Paul and meet him for lunch and you know he was like an uncle or a dad you know he was always that go-to guy a really known and loved character actor he was very much a part of the process encouraging of all of us as young actors and really hip and right there god rest his soul he was a good guy don't mess with the bull young man you'll get the horns what we found out is that each one of us is a brain and an athlete and a basket case a princess and a criminal does that answer your question i'll never forget the first time i saw breakfast club with a big audience and it was in the west side of chicago and the audience was kinetic electric with sort of a response kids would say a line on screen and kids in the audience would respond and there was a sort of you know prayer group meeting to it that i think People recreate in their own home movie environments now when they see those movies. Around 10 years after Breakfast Club came out, I felt like, why was this movie never going to go away? I mean, I'm trying to do this, I'm trying to do that, I'm trying to, you know, grow up as an actress, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm very comfortable with where I am, and I like it. I like it that I have a daughter who's never seen a movie I've been in, but I think she's going to like this one when she sees it. I like that it isn't dated and it's still around. It's like a once-in-a-lifetime part. People don't get those kind of parts very often. So I feel like actually it's a huge gift, that the whole movie. But at this point, I can't believe that I was in a movie that has had that kind of, um, made that kind of stamp or had that kind of effect on so many people. It's crazy. You know, I've had a lot of time to think about the value and the, and the sort of impact that, that film had. And I'm honored by that and blown away to be a part of it. And I think that Really, my, my feeling about why the Breakfast Club works is that it's a sort of deconstruction of stereotypes. It it's, allows us to see everybody where we think they are, and then by the end, you know, if there is a moral or a fable to it, that it's we're all more alike than we thought, you know? And I think that that's powerful. Okay, fine, but that doesn't make an A-list bizarre. What's bizarre? I mean, we're all pretty bizarre. Some of us are just better at hiding it, that's all. And it was strange when it came out that I would get letters from all over the world. Like, I didn't realize that the uh, high school experience, not specifically, but in a general sense, it's similar to people in Scandinavia, based on their letters, or people in Eastern Europe. It was like, what, what? Because we think it's gonna be so much different. It's not. These are characters that still exist, you know? They're not characters that only existed in 1984. These are the kind of people that are still in high school. So you just stripped to the things that you know. Shopping, nail polish, your father's BMW, and your poor, rich, drunk mother in the Caribbean. Shut up! And as far as being concerned about what's going to happen when you and I walk down the hallways of school, you can forget it, because it's never going to happen. Just bury your head in the sand and wait for your fucking prom. I hate you. Yeah? Good. What was interesting about The Breakfast Club, what was new about The Breakfast Club, was the fact that it took teenagers' concerns seriously. It was intense. Um, it did not condescend to its audience. It was, it was a serious film about young people's emotions. And that was what made it punk rock. The whole thing of John Hughes and his movies and how they were, they, were, they had become the standard for youth movies and teen movies, and we had this big love-hate with them because we love the movies. We talked about it when we made Heathers, you know. What do you think about those John Hughes movies? Oh, well, they're really good, they're really funny. What's your favorite? I like 16 Candles, I like Breakfast Club, whatever it is. And in a lot of ways, Heathers was kind of an extension or and in many ways an homage to what, what John was doing. Just the fact that the term teen movie even exists is kind of insulting. Nobody says adult movie, you know? They, these are just films that happen to have teenage protagonists. And there's so much opportunity for storytelling and character development. You can tell just about any story. You're just, you're just seeing it through, through the lens of adolescence. A lot of people could sort of look down their nose and go, oh, teen movie, but I mean, that, that encompasses a lot of different kinds of movies. I mean, if you think Clockwork Orange, he didn't go to school because he had a pain in the gulliver. 
Well, then that means this is a teen movie. Now, would you call Clockwork Orange a teen movie? Just because you're only, you've only been alive for 15 years doesn't mean you're any less anything except old. That's all it means. Doesn't mean you're less experienced necessarily. It doesn't mean you're less intelligent. It doesn't mean you're less sensitive. It doesn't mean you're taking things less seriously. It's like these are for younger human beings. Meaning don't, because they're only 10, start thinking that they don't know what you're talking about. Because they do. Don't leave people out in the cold. Don't. And don't talk down to people. Don't. It never works out. Sincerely yours, The Breakfast Club. People were always asking that when it first came out. Well, what do you think is going to happen on Monday? Like, I don't know. I'd like to see how, how Allison comes in to school on Monday. I think I'll support Allison either way. Whatever she does, that's how I'm going to play it.